Welcome back to the second half of Letters to Mozart. Thank you for joining us in this journey of rediscovering Mozart's music through his letters and words. I am Priscilla Fong, a Singaporean mezzo-soprano and your host for tonight. In this half of the concert, we will have three special guests who will be reading Mozart's letters and sharing their thoughts on this composer. Of course, this will be accompanied by plenty of amazing music to enjoy. To kickstart this concert, we have Dr. Mark Rochester. He is a music critic and a senior lecturer at the Yong Suto Conservatory of Music to read one of Mozart's final letters with us. This is a letter Mozart wrote to his wife Constanza, who was in Baden recovering from giving birth to a son. Mozart himself had stayed back in Vienna to put the finishing touches on his opera Die Zauberflöte. The reference to Blanchard in the letter refers to what was headline news at that time in Vienna, the antics of a French balloonist who had sailed his balloon across the English Channel from France to England. Mozart clearly had a certain scepticism for this achievement, but more than that, he was concerned both about money and about missing his wife. The letter is dated Vienna, 6th of July, 1791. Dearest, most beloved little wife, your message about receiving the money I sent safely gave me indescribable comfort. But I don't recall writing that you should settle everything. How could I, sensible fellow that I am, write such a thing, if it's true? I must have been very absent-minded, which, of course, is quite possible, because I have a lot of things spinning around in my head. What I thought I had said was to take care of the babe only. The rest of the money is for your own use. And what we will owe, I already made a list of expenses, I shall take care of it when I get out there. Right now, Blanchard will either go up in his balloon or fall the Viennese for a third time. You cannot really make me happier than when you are having fun and feeling relaxed. As long as I know for sure that you have everything you need, then all my efforts become a thing of joy and pleasure. The most miserable and perplexing situation in which I find myself becomes unimportant compared with knowing that you are well and in a happy mood. And now... Farewell. Make good use of your fool at dinner time. Think and talk about me and love me as I love you. And be my Stanzi Marina forever, just as I will always be your snail. Give our son a box on the ear and tell him that you were swatting a fly that I had seen sitting on his face. Adieu. Catch, catch. Bye, bye, bye. Three little kisses, sweet as sugar, are buzzing around and coming your way. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for reading that letter and giving us a little insight into the drama-filled life of Mozart. This leads us very nicely into the first piece of tonight. Joanne and Hang Jia will be performing some of Mozart's arias rearranged for the bassoon and the cello. So get comfy in your living room or wherever you're watching this from and enjoy.
Next up, we have Lionel Choi. He is an independent presenter of classical music in Singapore, the founder of Alton Bird Arts, and also the former artistic director of the Singapore International Piano Festival to read one of Mozart's letters for us. To Gottfried von Jakin in Vienna, Prague, October 15th, 1787. Dearest friend, you're probably thinking that my opera has been performed by now. Well, you're a bit mistaken there. First of all, the stage personnel here is not quite as capable as the personnel in Vienna when it comes to learning an opera like this one in so short a time. Second, I found on my arrival here that very few preparations and arrangements had been made for it, and it would have been totally impossible to have the opera ready on the 14th, which was yesterday. So they gave my Figaro instead. Yesterday, in a fully illuminated theatre, and I myself was conducting. Don Giovanni is now scheduled for the 24th. October 21st. Don Giovanni had been set for the 24th, but one of the singers who was taken ill has caused another delay. Since the company is small, the impresario has to be constantly concerned about sparing his people as much as possible so that he won't be plunged by some unexpected illness into the most critical of all critical situations not to be able to stage a performance at all. Therefore, everything here is quite a bit slower because the singers are too lazy to rehearse on opera days and the manager is too timid and fearful to push them. But what's this? Is it possible? What visions are coming before my ears? What am I hearing with my eyes? A letter from... I'm rubbing my eyes until they hurt. The letter is... The devil take me, God protect me. It's from you. If winter weren't sitting before my door, I would kick in the stove. But since I need my stove quite early this year, and since I will probably still need it in the days ahead, you will permit me to express my surprise in a more restrained manner by simply telling you in a word or two that I am exceedingly delighted to get some news from you and your dear family. October 25th. Today is the 11th day that I began scribbling on this letter. You can see from it that there is no lack of goodwill. Whenever I find a moment, I paint another small piece of it. Unfortunately, I cannot stay with it because my life belongs to other people and not enough to myself. I don't need to tell you that this is not my preferred way of life. The opera will be performed for the first time on Monday, the 29th. I shall give you an account of it the very next day. As far as the aria is concerned, let me just say it's not possible right now to send it to you for reasons that I will tell you in person. Farewell for now. Please kiss the hand of your gracious mother for me and give my warmest regards to your sister and brother and rest assured that I shall always remain your true friend and servant, W.A. Mozart. Everyone talks about the extraordinary genius that was Mozart. So much of his works were textbook in terms of form and structure, but they also had that something extra, a divine quality unmatched by anyone else at the time. Besides the obvious incredible melodic ideas, there is this sheer perfection of line and phrasing, and his slow movements ached with quite a profound, deep lyricism. When I was growing up learning to play the piano, I often had this mistaken notion that Mozart was simply easier to play than Beethoven. Learning and playing the notes themselves were certainly easier. But as I grew older and I was able to better put Mozart's writing into a more precise artistic and historical context, I came to realize that Mozart's music actually posed tremendous challenges to the performer. Its apparent simplicity disguises tremendous complexity, not just in pure musical terms, but also in terms of technical challenge. Every part is just so much more exposed, and the slightest error would just be that much more obvious. Any conductor or orchestra player will tell you it requires that much more discipline, control, and precision when playing Mozart, as compared to middle period or late Beethoven, Brahms, and so on. Another challenge is to figure out if Mozart should be played with that sort of 
uber reverence, tea room elegance and sophistication that seems the trend since the 80s when digital recordings were first introduced. Compared to Beethoven, where you can convey aggression, passion and pathos in more obvious ways, Mozart's music seemed smaller and therefore had to be played prettily and in a far narrower range, certainly in terms of tone quality and dynamics. But is that really right? Unlike Haydn, 20 odd years older, but musically productive in more or less the same period in history, a lot of Mozart's output wasn't necessarily written for royalty or for the aristocrats. Rather, a lot of the music was written for the enjoyment and the appreciation of the people, the masses. When you hear Mozartian Allegro in a major key, should it be played with urbane politeness and preciousness? I actually think not. That sense of unbridled joy, sparkle, electricity and excitement should be given much fuller, bolder voice. Of course, it still needs to be done with 18th century taste and sensibilities, but politeness probably has little place in Mozart's music, which conveys far more than what the actual score seems to reveal. Mozart was fun-loving, threw and attended wild parties, with plenty of food, drink and much else. And all this often upset his stern father. Mozart was probably an outspoken, temperamental, emotional bon vivant. There's no reason why his music should be played like he was so precious and fragile. To me, Mozart felt the full spectrum of human emotions and he expressed them and his soul as fully in his music. We need to find the subtle clues to unlock them. Thank you, Lionel, for sharing your thoughts. Now, to end of this concert, we will be enjoying a gorgeous quartet. It was originally written for the flute, but rearranged here for the bassoon. So without further ado, here is Mozart's quartet in G major. <laughs>
Finally, we have Daryl Ang. He is the Artistic Director and Chief Conductor of the Sichuan Orchestra of China, a Grammy-nominated conductor and a frequent guest with some of the world's major orchestras to read Mozart's final letter and to share his thoughts about this composer with us. Vienna, October 14th, 1791. Dearest and best little wife, yesterday, Thursday the 13th, Hofer and I drove out to see Carl. We had lunch there and afterward drove back. At six o'clock, I fetched Salieri and Madame Cavalieri with a carriage and took them to my box. Then I quickly drove back to pick up Mama and Carl, who were waiting for me at Hofer's. You can't believe how sweet they both were and how much they enjoyed not only my music, but the libretto and everything. Both of them told me it was an opera fit to be played at the grandest festivity before the greatest monarch. And they would certainly go and see it more often because they had never seen a more beautiful and more pleasant spectacle. Salieri listened and watched with great attention. And from the overture all the way through to the final chorus, there was not a single number that did not elicit from him a bravo or a bello. He and Cavalieri went on and on thanking me for doing them such a great favor. They had wanted to see the performance yesterday, but would have had to get their seats by four o'clock. So this way they were able to see and hear it all without being rushed. After the performance, I took them home and then had supper with Carl at Hofer's. Then the two of us drove home and we both slept heavenly. Carl was so delighted that I had taken him to the opera. He looks great. He couldn't be at a better place for his health, but everything else is unfortunately pretty bad out there. The place is probably all right for producing some fine peasants for the world, but enough of it. I had Carl excused from school until Sunday after lunch because his serious studies, heaven help him, will not begin until Monday. I told the school that you would like to see him and tomorrow Sunday I shall come out to Baden with him for a visit. Then either you can keep him there or I'll take him back to Hacker after lunch. Think about it. I don't believe that his education will go down the drain if he stays out of school for a month. And in the meantime, maybe something will come of my talks with the Pierrists. They are considering his acceptance. Apart from all that, Carl is neither worse nor better than he was before. He has the same bad manners, likes to get attention as always, enjoys learning even less than before because all he does is go out there walking in the garden five hours in the morning and five hours in the afternoon. He told me that himself. In other words, the children are not doing anything except eating, drinking, sleeping, and going for walks. Lightgap and Hofer are here with me right now. Lightgap will stay and eat with me. In fact, I've sent my faithful comrade Primus already to fetch us a meal from the Burgerspital. I'm really quite satisfied with Primus. He let me down just once, forcing me to sleep over at Hofer's, which annoyed me very much because they get up too late for my taste. I am happiest at home because I can follow my own established order. That one incident had put me in a pretty bad mood. 
Yesterday, I wasted a whole day going out to Bernstorf. That's also the reason why I couldn't write to you, but it is unforgivable that you haven't written to me in two days. I hope to hear from you today for sure. And tomorrow, I expect to speak with you myself and kiss you with all my heart. Farewell, forever yours, Mozart. The last letter reading has brought us to the end of Letters to Mozart. Thank you for joining us. I have had the most wonderful time uncovering Mozart's music through his letters and words. I hope you've enjoyed yourself as much as I have. We would like to take the chance to thank our supporters without whom this concert would not have been possible. The biggest shout out to the National Arts Council, VCH Presents, and the Trailblazers Foundation for their generous support. Now with that, thank you, good night, and I look forward to seeing you again. If Mozart were alive today, I would like to say to him, thank you, Wolfi, for your music. Your music makes this world so much better. I thank you for it. Thank you.